Okay, well, in this uh, video lecture, we're going to look at three main themes leading into World War II. Uh, we're going to examine the rise of fascism in Italy, Nazism in uh, Germany, and we're going to look at the rise of militarism in Japan. It's important to understand the rise of these dictatorships if we're going to actually understand how World War II plays out and what were the main causes. The key question that I think we have to answer in all three countries that become part of the Axis powers is why? Why do so many people turn to uh, dictatorships? Uh, this is the 20th century. This is a time of, uh, of educated populations, especially in Germany. Germany turns to um, to the Nazis and, and they're the most educated country in the entire world in the 1930s. So th that question has to be answered. Um, when most historians look at Germany and Italy, and to a lesser extent even Japan, although Japan's going to be a little bit of a different situation. Um, economics cannot be left out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the debate. Um, actually, most historians turn to economic depression um, and uh, fear of economic instability as a reason for the rise of these dictatorships. In the case of, um, uh, in the case of Germany, uh, I think we have to look at the Weimar Republic that was set up after World War I, uh, after the, uh, the Kaiser had abdicated the throne, uh, the Treaty of Versailles had been put and placed onto uh, uh, Germany, uh, and um, this new republic was formed, although a democracy it struggled greatly, mainly due to the fact that it had to uh, engage in these uh, massive reparations that were required of it uh, because of the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Those reparations had created a situation in which Germany could not um, invest in its own economy at the same time paying for, uh, paying for these massive reparations. So what Germany tried to do to stimulate its economy, to get its economy going, at the same time that all this wealth is leaving Germany and going to places like France and Great Britain, um, is they decided to print more money. Uh, to try to get the economy going. This, of course, was the worst thing that Germany could do in the 1920s because printing more German marks, which you see in these pictures, um, only devalued the money and caused inflation. Kind of like what we talked about with the, the Spanish Empire bringing all that gold in uh, from the New World. As something becomes more common, it loses value. As it loses value, prices go up. Um, and in Germany, runaway inflation created a huge economic crisis uh, to the point where money had no value, people were bartering, uh, jobs were lost, and people went into intense poverty. As you see in these photographs here, um, you could see children stacking money. Uh, those are blocks of German marks that they're just using as toys because they're literally at the, at the height of the inflation. It wasn't worth the, the paper it was printed on. In the middle picture here, you can see a woman in Germany heating her house by just burning German marks uh, in her furnace uh, rather than coal. Uh, and to the right, you see a man wheel, taking a wheelbarrow to uh, presumably a store or uh, or some kind of other marketplace, it was uh, w widely spread that it, at the height it cost uh, millions of marks to buy a loaf of bread, and so people would have to use these wheelbarrows to get them all to market. And so um, by the, the 19, early 1920s, Germany was in complete economic chaos, um, and they're going to try to pull themselves out of the economic chaos. But the Germans don't feel that they can do that um, unless reparations are lessened. By the late 1920s, Germany was just starting to pull itself out of this horrible economic crisis uh, when Great Depression hit the Western world. The Great Depression that started really in the United States in 1929 is not just an American thing. I think as we've learned in school and as we've gotten older, we tend to think of uh, the Great Depression as just being this kind of American phenomenon. It wasn't. Markets were integrated between Europe uh, in the United States, what that means is that countries have invested in each other. So when the United States stock market went down, it hurt an already fragile economy uh, in Europe uh, and started to drag their economies down as well. And so by 1929, we saw across Europe and the United States massive unemployment, horrible economic crisis, uh, people without money and people without jobs. Uh, and just as Germany was trying to pull itself out of the economic crisis of the 1920s, um, we find themselves right back into horrible economic situations. 
some of the sources we are going to look at on the Weimar Republic is we're going to examine this, and we're going to examine some information on too as to why economic crisis led to to right wing extremism in the form of fascism and, and Nazism. Um, and the key here that I want you to understand is that the strong leadership, and what I mean by that is like strongman type leadership, dictatorships that was uh, created in the forms of Mussolini and Hitler. Um, Although they reject democracy, they seem to provide economic stability. Um, Hitler even more so than Mussolini. Uh, what Hitler was willing to do was to play brinksmanship with other countries, which means he was trying to, you know, he's ready to you know, be standoffish with them. Hitler understood that uh, the Treaty of Versailles and the reparations were one of the things that was crippling the German economy. The German economy could get themselves going if they could get out of those reparations and take the money that the government spent on those reparations, reinvested it in the German economy, created jobs. Much like what the United States was doing under FDR and the New Deal. Um, and so that's exactly what he's going to do. Hitler was one person willing to risk war to, to cancel reparations. And so to understand why so many people were willing to go along with the rise of fascism and Nazism, we have to understand that those systems, although denying people democracy um, and discriminatory in the case of, uh, of Nazi Germany, um, provided people with economic stability and jobs, and that became a powerful influence of people going along with the rise to power. Fascism was the first of the right-wing ideologies the ultra-conservative nationalistic movements uh, of the 1920s and 30s. And um, Mussolini created the fascist party, and sometimes we generically use the word fascism and even apply it to, uh, to, uh, to the Nazis, uh, was the first. Um, to understand the basic ideas, it emphasized ultra-nationalism uh, and strength through militarism. So it was kind of a little bit of throwback to what was going on in, in World War One, but even more so. Mussolini talked about that to be um, the state was the true representative of the people. You have to be loyal to the state. That democracy was only a way for individuals to to work their own interests uh, within the state. So if you think about it this way, um, democracy was a way for people who want to get what they want and have their voice heard, so they can benefit themselves rather than the collective. So he talked a lot about what it is to be Italian, um, and the sacrifice you have to make to the state, and that you should follow the state, and democracy was unnecessary because the state would be the strong representative of the Italian people. Uh, in 1922, Benito Mussolini and his, his black shirts, is what his fascist party was called because they wore black shirts, um, seized power uh, in Italy, and he would rule Italy as a, as a dictator. Um, the word fascism comes from this old symbol known as the fasce, which actually the American government even uses. Um, it's an old Roman symbol. Uh, it was symbolic of the state. The axe was the state and the sticks were the people that were surrounding it and held together by the state. The idea that the, the central uh, thing that kept the people together was, um, was the government. He, Mussolini had a little bit of a flair for the dramatic and, and the use of Roman symbols, uh, and and he said that Italy's real destiny was expansionistic, was to expand its empire, and, and he wanted to recreate the Roman Empire, which seems to be a theme in European history since 476, since the fall of Rome. But he was he was determined to recreate it and expand Italy's borders, and he thought that um, in his own writings that if a country wasn't at war, that it wasn't progressing, that a country should continuously be at war, conquering, um, and we see, we're going to see that play out. Nazism uh, in Germany is, is also ultra-nationalistic, um, even to the point where the Nazis equated n national identity and, and their opinions of race. The National Socialist German Workers' Party um, was founded uh, and gained popularity throughout the 1920s. The term National Socialist is a little misleading because they're not socialist, um, but it was almost like you could achieve the goals of um, a better world and equality through ultra-nationalism. Uh, and what we're going to see is that ultra-nationalism of uh, the Nazis uh, and Hitler would actually end up uh, uh, creating crisis for, for many groups that weren't uh, considered German by their definition. 
The Nazis were really a fringe party. And as we're going to look at some of the election results in one of our packets, you're going to see that the Nazis really were considered a fringe party throughout most of the, the 1920s. Uh, they didn't gain, uh, garner much votes, despite the fact that the economic crisis were bad. Uh, they were seen as a bit radical. Um, and in 1923, the Nazis actually made uh, an attempt at overthrowing the Weimar Republic, uh, a coup coup d'etat, if you remember, to a blow to the state or an overthrow of a government, in what was known as the Beer Hall Pooch. And it was known as the Beer Hall Pooch because supposedly this plan was hatched out by Hitler and uh, his, closest, uh, uh, his closest party members in a beer hall in Munich. And perhaps that wasn't the best place to come up with an idea for overthrowing a government. Um, they attempted, they thought that if they created a um, uh, a violent attempt at overthrowing the government that it would appeal to nationalists that would come rallying to their cause. Instead, uh, all the conspirators were arrested, including Hitler, who was put into prison for several years. While in prison, he writes his book, uh, Mein Kampf, which is nothing more than um, ramble, or, you know, really rambling racist ideology, but it lays out his ideology of, for Germany, which will play out once he's in power, uh, which is some historians have just called simply space and race, that Germany uh, should be uh, ethnically one in his mind, which is going to lead to the Holocaust, and that there should be plenty of room for Germans to live, or what he called Lebensraum, which is going to play out in uh, the invasions of other countries. In 1932, what we're going to see in the elections of 32, after um, uh, the Depression hits Germany and massive loss of jobs, is that the Nazis are going to win popular votes. And again, I'm going to show you a graph on those election results in one of the packets, and you're going to see that um, they got barely any votes, and then they started to gain votes in popularity uh, in Germany. Uh, also, uh, he, Hitler was able to, and the Nazis are going to eventually able to create a crisis in which they, they paint a picture with the burning of the Reichstag, um, that there was an attempt to overthrow, com or a communist attempt to overthrow the government and, and still emergency powers in their hands. Um, Hitler also had a lot of conservative leaders on his side who thought they could help keep him in power, uh, and he got a lot of support from businessmen as uh, the Nazis were intensely anti-socialist and anti-communist um, and very pro-business, especially pro-big business. Um, so he got a lot of uh, um, uh, big business interest behind him, a lot of support, and a lot of money. Um, and those people thought that they could just use them. Um, but in reality, the Nazis had their own plans, and Hitler had his own plans and his rise to power. As I said, after gaining election results in 1932, um, the Reichstag, which was basically the German parliament, kind of like our Congress, uh, burned to the ground in 1933, a massive fire. It was arson. Uh, it was set on fire. And Hitler and, his, um, and, and the Nazis, they blamed communists. They even found a, a one guy uh, that they blamed for it. We don't know if he actually did or not. Rumors have always been uh, held that it was the Nazis that did it themselves uh, to create this crisis. But he painted this picture as if there was an attempted Bolshevik revolution on the rise um, in, in Germany and that it had to be stopped. And the only way to stop it was to hand over emergency powers uh, to the Nazis. Uh, and temporarily suspend uh, communism, which that vote was, or I'm sorry, not democracy rather. And that vote goes through and, and they temporarily suspend democracy. So one of the lessons of the rise of Nazis is they actually get to power democratically and then use the rules of their own democracy to destroy it uh, and to create a dictatorship under, uh, under Hitler uh, in Germany. And to enforce that dictatorship, um, we see the rise of uh, Hitler's elite troops, the SS, and the secret police, the Gestapo, uh, who were then used to pacify all the opposition through violence and, and threats of violence. So, um, in the next unit, we'll, we're, we're almost out of time in this clip. Uh, in the next clip, uh, we'll look at uh, the economic uh, consequences of the rise of Nazis, and we'll also look at the rise of militarism in Japan.